Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So a lot of us have seen this these dystopian movies. There's a trend of them coming out. They predict the downfall of civilization, some horrific future. But one of the ones that I think gets passed over because it was a little bit quirkier, is kind of more of a comedy, a little more British, is Terry Gilliam's uh, Brazil. And I think it's an amazing movie because... It doesn't just give us a dystopian future. It specifically looks at the bureaucratic aspect of what would happen. It predicts much of the kind of bureaucratic malaise and the terrible, uh, quiet desperation that many people feel when they're trapped in the kind of world that we have today. And so coming on to discuss that great film with me is Stephen Carson. He's the host of the Radical Liberation podcast. Stephen, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I just thought of this phrase, Aran, it's uh, Brazil is the deep state dystopia, right? It's the dystopia that we can connect to from our own experience. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, again, it's one of those that I think in some ways, uh, I wouldn't say understated because the movie obviously is very flamboyant at moments. Yeah, but yeah. like I said, it really captures that the way that you are stuck inside of this machine. You feel hopeless, feel like there, there there's very little yeah. escape. And Terry Gillum is a director who's very visually gifted. The story of this film is not particularly complicated, but the uh, but the events, the way they're depicted, are very very much capture the essence of that experience. I know you're a big fan of the director, so I want to go ahead and dive into his general style and then the specifics of what makes this movie so great. But before we do that, guys, let me tell you a little bit about ISI. Universities today aren't just neglecting real education. They're actively undermining it, and we can't let them get away with it. America was made for an educated and engaged citizenry. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is here to help. ISI offers programs and opportunities for conservative students across the country. ISI understands that conservatives and right-of-center students feel isolated on college campuses and that you're often fighting for your own reputation, dignity, and future. Through ISI, you can learn about what Russell Kirk called the permanent things, the philosophical and political teachings that shaped and made Western civilization great. ISI offers many opportunities to jumpstart your career. They have fellowships at some of the nation's top conservative publications like National Review, The American Conservative, and The College Thinker. If you're a graduate student, ISI offers funding opportunities to sponsor the next great generation of college professors. Through ISI, you can work with conservative thinkers who are making a difference. Thinkers like Chris Rufo, who currently has an ISI researcher helping him with his book. But perhaps most importantly, ISI offers college students a community of people that can help them grow. If you're a college student, ISI can help you start a student organization or a student newspaper or meet other like-minded students at their various conferences and events. ISI is here to educate the next generation of great Americans. To learn more, go to isi.org. That's isi.org. All right, so before we dive into Brazil itself, let's talk a little bit about its director, because I think Terry Gillum is a guy who has a very specific style. Like I said, it's incredibly unique. That's one of the things that lends this movie part of its genius, because it communicates so much of the dystopia in a visual manner. And it's interesting because most people probably just know him as the other guy from Monty Python, right? It's not John Cleese uh, from Monty Python. <laughs> he, he's one of these guys. He, he had a couple of movies early on that were aimed at more of a mainstream audience, I think, with things like uh, uh, like Time Bandits. I've seen a, seen a few of his movies. Probably 12 Monkeys is the other big commercially successful one most people would be familiar with yeah. but he feels like the kind of guy that uh, you know he he kind of goes into hiding for five years and then emerges to make a weird movie and then goes back underground and you know if he sees his shadow and so can you talk a little bit about Gillum and his uh, his kind of movie and directing style yeah so <clears throat> Gilliam uh was part of the Monty Python crew and uh the, the, those guys and he was involved with some of their films right like uh, Monty Python the Holy Grail Life of Brian, Meaning of Life. He directed at least two of them, I think. Um, and uh, and Time Bandits, I view as sort of transitional. I, I love it. I recommend it. Uh, I've watched, I've shown it to my kids. Um, it's kind of transitional. It feels a bit more like a Monty Python film. It's got kind of like sketches, little little sort of pieces you could watch by themselves, 
right? Sort of a series of sketches where he's, they're bouncing around in history. Um, but you, you start to see Gilliam uh, uh, finding his own way. It's not quite a Monty Python film. It's not quite a Gilliam film. With Brazil, which is his next film after, um, uh, yeah, after Time Bandits, uh, this is now Gilliam finding his voice. And after this, his films, I think, are just just brilliant. The, the greatness begins with Brazil, and it just keeps going through his other films. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> Gilliam is one of my two favorite directors, along with David Lynch, um, the, the American director, David Lynch. And what, one of the things I find in common between them is an emphasis on dreams. If you've ever seen Twin Peaks, which if you haven't, do it. Uh, <laughs> um, if you haven't seen the Twin Peaks series, uh, there's a big emphasis on dreams. He's using dreams, uh, Special Agent Cooper is using dreams to actually help solve the, the mystery, right? So dreams are actually a part of the plot. Well, in Brazil, dreams are uh, uh, about as far forward as they are in any of uh, Gilliam or Lynch's work. Um, the, the dreams are a major part of how we know what is inside the heart of the main character, right? Because uh, when, when he's in the real world, when he's not dreaming, he's kind of a drone stuck in a bureaucratic world. Uh, he seems a bit hapless, you know, kind of pushed around. Um, and uh, he's starting to maybe find that he, uh, throughout the, the plot, he's starting to find that he, he has things he cares about, wants to fight for. But in his dreams, he's a, he's a hero, right? <laughs> he, he, he is the center of the dream, and he's, uh, these are not nightmares. These are heroic dreams, uh, fantasy. His dreams are um, uh, like fantasy, you know, like uh, the genre, fantasy, the genre, like think Tolkien or something, right? Uh, filled with flying and fighting and and uh, up in the sky, it's it's he's broken out. He's out of the box in his dreams. Right? Yeah, he looks like Ziggy Stardust with giant angel wings flying around. Right, right. like it's a, it's a radically yeah. it's radically juxtaposed to his existence is as like you said this cog in the machine of this giant bureaucratic yeah. state, and and that definitely shows. I, again, I think it very much captures that quiet desperation that a lot of people feel when they're stuck in corporate jobs. I mean, The Matrix does this in a way, obviously. It's, it's famous for breaking you out of The Matrix and you know, Neo's in this you know, very boring office job doing this coding or whatever. But Brazil does it, in, a, in again, a far more fantastic way. It feels almost like a, like a Dio album or you know, some, some kind of power metal album yeah. art as, he, as he's flying around trying to free the princess from these, uh, you know, from these evil people and everything. It, it it definitely evokes a, a much different uh, spirit. It, it's not all this slick '90s stuff. It it definitely uh, has that '80s fantasy, uh, you know, Willow or something like that feel to yeah. It, uh, yeah. it involved in there. So uh, let's go ahead and start at the beginning. You know, to to kind of set the stage for people. The film begins with uh, one of these dream sequences, so we kind of know what's going on right. uh, in, in his head. But then we also see this extremely oppressive uh, and very British bureaucratic world. Uh, you know, the the, mm -hmm. the world that we are introduced to is one that is uh, there's lots of the first thing I notice is lots of ductwork. Ductwork yeah. is everywhere in this film. Like the hilarious thing about the ductwork is it's this industrial grade. It's very ugly and it's strewn through everything. So even when you're in fancy restaurants like we get a scene where he's supposed to be eating mm -hmm. uh, in this fancy restaurant with uh, his mother and everything there's still this duct work just coming out of the bottom of what are supposed to be these fancy tables and strewn throughout yeah. everywhere so it's just very ugly and oppressive and when yeah. the, you know when we look at the technology there's lots of technology everywhere but in a way it's like uh, it's like the technology like someone from the 1950s would imagine what technology would look like in the future right it, it's got the, there's mm -hmm. computers yeah. but they all look like typewriters and they have these giant magnifying glasses so things are technologically advanced but they're in a very particular ugly industrial way right yeah um uh, it's making me think of the cartoonist uh crom who when he draws a street he really brings forward all the telephone wires 
and the you know cables running around and stuff like that. Uh, it's like that, right? When you're in when you're in uh, the world of Brazil, uh, the the infrastructure is almost cartoonishly exaggerated, right? With the ductwork everywhere, it, it, it's so that you can't ignore that you're sort of uh, shrinking down in the midst of all this infrastructure that sort of oppresses you. And and an important plot point, you can't touch it. You can't touch the ductwork or, you know, you got to get the right licensed people and, and fill out the right forms or you are toast. You know, <laughs> They will crush you. <laughs> yeah, we, we see early on that uh, they're, they're the, the kind of how the bureaucracy is brutal towards people and cares very little about them while like you said, just, just burying them under this stuff. So the things that sets the events in motion, and guys, spoiler spoiler alert, alert for a movie that is literally as old as I am. It, you know, it's a very old movie. So, uh, you know, if you haven't seen it by now, fix that. But we're, we're going to be talking about the plot here. We have to. So uh, so what sets the events in motion is that, you know, the basically the, the torture orders that come up for dissidents inside the bureaucracy are typed out in these old style typewriters that automatically print out. And one of the guys is trying to smash a bug, right? There's like this comedic yeah. scene because the whole thing is, is a satire while also being extremely dark at the same time. Yeah. And he's, so there's this kind of this comedic scene where the guy is trying to, you know, stack all this really cheap bureaucratic furniture on top of each other so he can kill the one fly in his tiny office that's bothering him. And the fly drops onto the typewriter and messes up the type and it misses it by one letter. And so uh, after, you know, this absurd scene of this guy trying to go ahead and, and, you know, kind of get this fly, we get a hit squad that is coming after the guy who just got the wrong order. And so just this average British man with his family sitting there watching Christmas. Random guy. Yeah, yeah. And they like cut a hole and they slide in and this whole SWAT team shows up and, you know, uh, you know threatening the murder and murder him. And they bag him up. Oh, and they, put, they, they put a hood over his head and take <laughs> him away. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and then the best part is, you know, at the end of this whole thing, his, you know, traumatized wife has to like sign a form in triplicate. You know, <laughs> right. the, the bureaucrat right. comes in and it's like, no, you have to press down harder. Make sure that we get the, you know, we get the signature traced Goes in through. so that you have a receipt for the murder of your husband. Right, right, right. Yeah. Because they, they have to um, pay for their own execution or right. something. It comes out of their account, which which is the next plot point. Yeah, yeah, and so and so that's that's kind of the 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 world we're set in. We actually, uh, I should say, the movie actually starts with a little vignette of a of an absurd kind of Christmas commercial, and as people are pushing the cart by uh, uh, during the absurd uh, kind of very British Christmas commercial, t trying to sell some insane product on a, on a wall full of TVs for Christmas, the whole thing explodes. Right. Like they're, 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 yeah. there's a whole there's explosion. So we know this is a world that is very uh, is very regimented, very de depressed and, and, and oppressively bureaucratic. But we also know there's like terrorism happening in the background. Right. For, for, from that visualization. Yeah. And I and I wonder on how much that resonates now. I remember visit, revisiting Brazil around the 9-11 era and feeling like, wow, Gillian was a prophet. Yes. Terrorism. And, uh, you know, the, we're all being oppressed in the name of terror, you know, terrorism and stuff. And and how much is the government like kind of behind it in a way? You know, um, all these thoughts were brought up by Brazil where, uh, you know, to make it comically absurd, things blow up and everybody just goes about their business almost as if nothing happened. They just kind of sweep a little bit and, and move on, you know? Like this is, they, you know, the, the implication being that these terror, terror incidents are just happening all the time and yeah. just people go about their lives, you know? Yeah, again, that's <laughs> another absurdist thing get, it gets introduced in the fancy restaurant scene where they're all sitting there yeah. trying to eat their fancy food which isn't it's gross it they they have to pick from a like a like a a, a cheap uh mcdonald's style menu you have to say the number you can't tell me you want a steak you have to pick the fast food number even though we're in a fasty restaurant and then they just get like right, a, right. a slop of goop that has the picture of the of the actual dish on top of it but during this whole thing you know the that scene that everything explodes and there's lots of terrorism and everyone is, you know, the waiters are kind of embarrassed. Like all the people eating there are like, oh, you can't get rid of the terrace as if there's like a homeless man sitting in front of you know, the whole thing. <laughs> sure. And you wonder how much of that is supposed to, is like a rep is like a reflection of the British experience 
of uh, kind of the World War II bombings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the keep on and carry right. on thing where we're supposed to just keep right. consuming and act like everything's normal, even though things are exploding right. around us. Yeah, and it's sort of a bomb, what do they call it? bomb shelter humor or whatever, right? Right. Sort of a carrying that tradition forward. <laughs> yeah. So so we we have our main character and he gets introduced to this whole thing because he works in like the information department. He's got to file a check yeah. somewhere, right? Like the, the, the right. check has to be written to the family uh, of the guy who ended up dying in his interrogation for being a terrorist, even though he wasn't a terrorist, right? And right. and so he you know uh, and we find out that and, and, and the, yeah the main the, the the issue is that the main character realizes that there's been a mistake right and that you know like like it's not lining up the name of the person who got snatched and the name of the person who he's supposed to be charging for it or debit, crediting back they're not the same name they're off by one letter as you explained right <laughs> yeah and and that's and that's the whole terrifying thing for them is that the bureaucracy is supposed to be perfect like one of the propaganda posters because we get a lot of these 1984 style propaganda mm. posters throughout the film and one of them is that information makes you free that that is one of their big things is we have all the information we have all the experts we know all the answers right and so this is a very scientific you know people today will recognize all of these claims right we have a very scientifically perfect system yeah. that has been measured out the experts are in charge and because we have all the data and we have all the science and, you know, the science is always correct, then in, any idea that the bureaucracy would make a mistake is ridiculous. It's on, it's de facto, yeah. it, you know, ridiculous. And so the fact we, that we, his, we, we have we have studies, we have studies. So exactly, don't worry exactly. about it. Now. Right. Yeah. yeah trust, right. Just trust the science. It's fine. And so right. uh, and, and so the fact that his boss, you know, re, he finds this mistake and his his boss just melts down. That, you know, that how would we ever yeah. fix this, right? Like how th this is the end. We're all done. We're all fired. The, the and he wants to, he wants to, his immediate instinct, his boss is shh, hush, right. quiet, you know, like, like, don't, don't let anyone know that there's been a mistake, right? We've got to just, we've got to cover it up. Yeah. Right. And so he, as this guy who wants to escape, uh, you know, it, it, this kind of oppressive bureaucracy at any moment, he goes ahead and volunteers to drive, right? I'll, I'll go out, even though this is something they never do, I'll go drive and deliver this check. And, and when he does- oh, hand, uh, hand deliver. And I didn't think about this, Aaron, but this is, he's not thinking about it this way yet, right? But this is a moment of him kind of breaking free of the machine a little bit, right? He's mm -hmm. deviating from processes and what, what's been designed. And he's, instead of doing a bureaucratic process, he is going and going to make human contact. He's going to actually interact with these people personally, not through a process, right? Exactly. Yeah, though the woman doesn't have the bank account she's supposed to have, and so they can't just do the impersonal transaction to the widow. Normally, they would just, you know, right. and, and, and it's some absurd amount. It's like 30 bucks. That's the great thing. <laughs> like, like your husband is yeah. murdered. We owe you $30, right? Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. That, you know, so it's, it's some absurd amount. And normally they would just mail this $30 check. It's funny because one of the reasons I, I wanted to watch this movie was someone I knew was having an issue like this with the IRS where their grandmother had died. <laughs> and, they, oh, no. they, and they were like in this long six month battle trying not to get, you know, not, you know, to figure out what to do with a hundred, but a hundred dollar check. The IRS simply would not stop calling. They're like, whatever. I don't care about the hundred dollars. Like, I, I this is you know, yeah, let it go. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like, oh yeah. So yeah, th this is literally the world we live in. This is very, very much right. The case. Yep. And I love when he's driving again. So, so much of this is is communicated in in the visual uh, with, with Gil. Yeah. But when he's driving, the billboards on the roads are on both sides. It's just a wall. There is yep. no. You can't yeah, see yeah. any of the you landscape. All you see is billboards. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so so there's yes. never this moment where you go you go from your high rise apartment building where you can't see anything but the city, and then you you know you you go to the office where you can't see anything but the you know these ugly duct work everywhere, and then even when you drive to some other part of the world, you you are always stuck inside this tunnel of advertisement. Right. Yeah, and in his dreams, he is in the sky and the clouds, among trees. Right. He's he's out of this uh, inhuman, industrial, bureaucratic, soulless environment. 
Absolutely. So so when he finally arrives there, he discovers that the woman from his dreams that he's been dreaming about actually lives yeah. upstairs, right? She's she's the she's been complaining uh the whole time. We start to see her uh you know trying to figure out what's going on with this this poor man who's been drug away. And so he discovers that she's upstairs, but he can't get to her. And eventually she starts showing up to the records department he's at because she wants to file. Yeah. Oh, there's been a false arrest, this kind of thing. Yeah. And so that's how he, he figures she's out. She's trying to help this family who lost their, their the, the husband, the father of the family. And she's trying to intervene as a, as a neighbor. Yeah. Right. And, and she goes again through this very DMV like process where she goes yeah. to one department, like, sorry, you haven't stamped the form of the arrest receipt. We, we can't pull any <laughs> of the information. You have to go to the other one. I've already been to that department. I can't, you know, right, they're, they're right. not allowed to, to talk about that yeah. until you've seen and so she's she's running around this you know this whole kind of gerbil uh you know uh, uh terrarium thing uh trying to figure out how to get into a department and he's like trapped up against the glass constantly chasing her you know getting stuck in, in elevators that go out of uh, out and people put you know signs that it can't be fixed for the next two weeks because they haven't filed the paperwork as they're like going right. around this whole time and she she's not she's not submissive to this whole system right i mean she's trying to work with it out of necessity but but she clearly is not trusting the process she screams at people she's emotional she isn't just like okay i'll, I'll go get in that line now she's she's angry she's she's uh alive right yeah and that's absolutely one of the things that draws him to her because you know, in, yeah. in in the other scenes, for instance, again with that with that uh, fancy restaurant scene, uh, his mother, who is well to do, she she he's a low level bureaucrat, but he obviously should have been more. That's a th one of the themes of the film is he was supposed to want yeah. to climb up in the bureaucracy, but he's just interested in having his daydreams, right? He doesn't he doesn't want to he doesn't like this world. He doesn't want to advance in it. He doesn't want to play the game. In, in particular, he has turned down promo a promotion because he didn't want the additional responsibility or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And that becomes very important later on in, in the storyline. And so uh, when, when he shows up, you know, the mother is disappointed. She wants to get him to take uh, the, this promotion. He gets angry and he's refusing it, but they're trying to set him up with the daughter of one of the, uh, one of his mother's friends. And she is this sheepish, you know, she, she's involved in the whole thing. Yeah. You know, and so the, this woman who's fiery and fighting back and, you know, and, and has that life, has the an animation, is coming from outside the system. She definitely is is uh, well contrasted with this other woman who is kind of yeah, playing the game. Right. Is You know, she's got like a bunch of facial. She's got these giant braces, that, you know, like headgear, <laughs> right. uh, like she's still stuck in middle school somewhere from the 70s, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a film, right? So she's not only unattractive in the sense of not having that liveliness of this woman he's drawn to, but she also just doesn't look that great, right? <laughs> right. So so yeah. uh, another big theme that is a part of this is the plastic surgery, right? One of the, the, the themes yeah. we see is, you know, when we're introduced to his mother, she's getting this comment. In fact, if you've only seen maybe two pictures from the movie, you've probably mm -hmm. seen this one where they're stretching the mother's yeah. face out like silly putty yeah. and the, you know, the doctor is trying <laughs> to decide where to cut on him. And very interestingly, just like uh, Gillum predicts a lot of the bureaucratic problems, he predicts a lot of the family problems because the mother that we never see the father, you know, we know that he died at some point. They have a conversation about uh, how he, he knew one of the upper ups and something, but you know, that he's, he's without a father. The son is without a father and the mother is treating him as something of uh, just a trophy or something to only pay attention to, uh, uh, you know, very fleetingly only when she can introduce him or, or try to, you know, uh, elevate yeah, she, him, make he, him play the game. He he is like a fashion accessory. If you've ever right. watched Absolutely Fabulous, you know exactly what I'm so the dynamic I'm describing. Yeah, right. And she yeah. uh, and she's constantly looking for the attention of younger men right in front of him. And so one of the reasons she's going through these plastic surgeries is to look more presentable to you know, so that it very much is that like uh, you know single mother who doesn't 
care very much about the child and is always just you know chasing after the attention of younger and younger men and that's the theme throughout she right. she keeps getting plastic surgeries you know all of the social events are are based around the reveal of her latest plastic surgery and each time <laughs> she gets younger she pays less and less attention to him at the end basically telling him just go away you know i i'm busy talking to all these younger men you don't matter to me anymore. right right yeah yeah i mean I, she's sort of the you know We'll, we'll talk about sort of the boomer stereotype, right? It's it's all about me. It's all about what I'm thinking about right now. What my I just want to be happy, to use a phrase from a boomer. Uh, just let me be happy, you know, and don't distract me with your stuff, you know. Right. Absolutely. So the the next big uh, big kind of twist is when he needs to find the information uh, to to track down this girl from his dreams. And I want to get into that because the information retrieval is a very interesting euphemism that ends up getting used in the film. I want to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, yeah. guys, let me remind you about your absolute moral duty to get out of the whole bureaucratic thing and hire based people in based companies through new founding. Hey guys, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, New Founding Talent. Look, we all know that the job market is a disaster right now. Based people can't find good companies to work for, and good companies can't find anybody to get the job done. The competency crisis is very, very real. So how do we get these two incredibly important groups together? We need organizations like New Founding. New Founding has created a network of high excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded American businesses. These are individuals, often in elite organizations, who are ready for a team and a mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are already using this network to hire high trust, exceptional individuals who can match the culture and mission of their teams. So if you're looking for better employees to build a better world, you need to go ahead and apply for access to the new founding talent network at newfounding.com backslash talent. You'll get connected with candidates who will build your business. That's newfounding.com backslash talent. Check it out today. All right. So before he gets transferred to information retrieval, he ends up deciding to take this promotion that he's been denying for a long time so he can. No, no, no. That's how he gets. That's how he, he, he's doing the promotion so he can be an information retrieval. Right, right. So he can get access to the information. Yeah. So he can get to the information about this lady. Yeah. Right. But, but but before that happens, he runs into an interesting character. So Robert De Niro is in this film out of nowhere. Right. And that's one of the beautiful things yeah. about this film. Like you get Robert De Niro and Bob Hoskins and all these guys who you wouldn't yeah. expect to be sprinkled in here as kind of uh, key yeah. players. But even though they're kind of in and, they, and, and they practically get like cameos. Right. I mean, they're yeah. not even on the they're not major characters. They're minor characters in the film. Yes. Yeah. It, <laughs> and so what you discover is that that uh, Robert De Niro is a, uh, he's an HVAC technician. He's, he's an air conditioner <laughs> repairman. And so when- He deals with the ducts. He deals right, with the ducts, deals with the ducts yeah. that, are, that are so often in there. Like you said, you're not allowed to touch him. You're not allowed to fix anything. No, the system always works. There's nothing ever wrong. Yeah. You know, the, the central services is this kind of, you know, the, the, uh, this uh, bureaucratic organization that takes care of all the maintenance. And he, our main character, calls in because his air conditioning gets stuck, and uh, but but they won't show up, and so uh, you know they they he he keeps getting a recording that says it's not a recording, telling him that you know the thing will be taken care of soon, and instead, uh, Robert De Niro's character shows up, and he's uh, the great thing about Robert De Niro's character is that he's this dangerous rogue, you know he's he's got to run in with a gun and he's got to scare the main character. And you reason find out the reason he has the gun is because fixing the ducks is illegal, and he's like the you know, he's a scab. He he's a non-union, non-government. He's a freelancer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fixing that, yeah. and so uh, and so he like runs in, and he like zip lines away from the building like Batman and yeah. everything. But right. he's just he's just some dude who fixes the air conditioning, fixes stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and, and effectively, he's like a pirate in this world, right? He's off right. the grid. He's he's out of the system. He oh, in fact, he said he left the system because he was too frustrated with the bureaucracy. He just wanted to fix things. You know? <laughs> yeah, th this is the most libertarian moment of the of the movie, yeah. right? Where he's like, I just got tired of. The, I just wanted to come in and work for someone and do the job and get paid. 
right? I, I didn't yeah. want the government. Yeah. I didn't want the bureaucracy. And this is what makes yeah. him like a violent criminal. And, right, right. And they are hunting. They want to kill him. And, and, and sorry, just to be clear, the, the name that got mistaken was his name. Yes. His name was typed wrong. And this poor, innocent fellow got killed. They were trying to take him out. This this dangerous air conditioner repairman. <laughs> yes, that's the that's the beauty of the whole thing, right? Is like we discover yeah. that the 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 guy the, the reason the guy ended up getting murdered is not because you know he's this horrific terrorist or he you know he's this yeah. menace to society. It's that they confused him with an illegitimate AC repairman. Like, right. That, that was that was the you know the fatal crime, and, and so yeah. uh, our character ends up meeting him, and that's important because. Uh, you know, yeah. the, he, he's a recurring character throughout the rest. But he, like you said, just in bit parts, he just shows up for a minute or two uh, throughout the film. So I just want to make sure we mentioned that. Um, and, and no, no surprise, have to say, Robert De Niro absolutely nails it. They're some of the best yeah. scenes of the film. I mean, they're great. You know? <laughs> yeah, again, absolutely. Just in there for the moment. But the moment he and you forget, like, it's really young De Niro. You know, it's it's in the. Yeah, 80s, yeah. You know, right. so, yeah. Uh, so. So it's a pretty young De Niro for the for that movie. Um, but, but he goes, he, he takes this, uh, promotion to the, uh, information retrieval bureau and you're thinking, okay, well, so that means like he sits around and he does a lot of, a uh, lot of computer work, which yeah, they do, but, uh, but he does this so he can find the girl, right? That's why he finally takes a promotion. He always hated so he can get the level of access necessary to search for this girl's name and everything. But what you slowly start to realize through clues uh, you know, like the the there's a, a stenographer listening to all of the the tape from what's going on, and she's typing it out, and you slowly realize it's notes from a torture. Yeah, and right. then, yeah. and you run right, into his right. friend. The retrieval of information, we're thinking like like computer land, right? It's it's right. getting information out of the database. No, no, no. It's retrieving information from people by any yes. means necessary. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And and he runs into his friend, which was introduced early in the film, the one a uh, film, uh, a friend who was chiding him for being so low ranking. And, you know, why aren't you know, why aren't you living up to your potential, the kind that your father and your your mother expected of you? And you discover that, uh, you know, you think he's a doctor and you slowly realize, oh, he's a doctor in the sense that, he, you know, he's torturing people, you know, and he's got yeah, this yeah, this yeah. weird mask on. Uh, this kind of that that's got the weird baby face again if you've never seen if you've seen a couple images from the film that's probably one that you've seen uh the character yeah. in the torture chair with that and and so you you slowly realize that uh that that's that's what's actually happening in this building and it's even more horrific because the guy wasn't supposed to die in fact the way that the uh the friend <laughs> who's the the torturer absolves himself of responsibility is that uh, because there was a mistake made in the lower uh, bureaucracy, uh, the the guy he tortured had a heart condition he wasn't supposed to have. And so he's not I mean, responsible for the murder. Was, he thought he was torturing Robert De Niro. And exactly. Some other guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah he got the, the poor, hapless, uh, you know, uh, kind of grandfather from the, uh, from the earlier scenes. And so that's the only reason that the guy died. And so he kind of puts off the responsibility... And again, yeah. the, just the how how easily human life is discarded here. Nobody cares. No one would know. This woman is trying to track down things, and she, they don't even know that he's dead. You know, and and, and uh, in the midst of this, for a lot of this, uh, they don't realize the husband is dead for for much of this, and uh, no one would have told her probably if it wasn't for the discovery of this check and everything. And so, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, there's just this constant showing of of how no one can be held accountable. It's all people just dying to a ridiculous system. There's no responsibility anywhere inside of the bureaucracy. Yeah, this is this Kafka, this Kafka-esque system doesn't have accountability. Everywhere you turn, you see people who find a way to do things, but not be responsible for what they're doing, not be held accountable for what they're doing. We're just a cog in the system. You can't, don't look at me. You know, it's nothing personal. It's just business, right? That's that's all the way through the movie. That's the uh, the attitude. Absolutely, and again, you can't help but feel how relevant that is today. You know, how how many police officers, how many FBI, you know, how how many uh, e even judges, people who are 
uh, you know, they're given the task of being a linchpin in the system of adjudicating issues would just turn around and say, well, I got the wrong data from the experts. I got the blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You can't really blame me. I'm not really someone who can bear responsibility. It just mirrors how much of our system is, is what Carlisle would have called a government by steam instead of one where actual people are held accountable and make real decisions <laughs> based on yeah. what they, what they understand. Right, right. Yeah. So there's not decisions. There's just process. Exactly. It's all, exactly. It's all process all the way down. <laughs> and that's again, that that's what's so beautifully communicated in every aspect of the movie. Everything is is hyper reality. There's no there's no real experiences involved. Everything is an echo of an echo of an echo. You start to see, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's technically Christmas happening and everyone exchanges gifts, but no one cares when they get them like no one <laughs> no one op ever opens them no one cares about what's inside them all all and everyone always gives the same gift they've just got like 12 of them sitting around the exact same wrapping paper <laughs> um you know it, it, the, the the billboards say you know like consumers for christ are the you know is the only uh kind of religious symbol we see involved with christmas you know oh, i it, missed that they're not yeah. kidding consumers for christ yeah oof oof Exactly. Exactly. But, well, but, it, but, it's, but it's, it reminds, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, our own, our own government that just, you know, celebrated, uh, you know, trans awareness yeah. day on Easter. Trans day and, of visibility. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the way that every corporation and every government has reduced every of our, every one of our Christian holidays into the secular symbols. So you're not allowed to have anything about Christ on Easter or, Christmas, but you can have Santa Claus, you can have reindeer, you can have Easter bunnies. You know, if, if this is the worst thing, if anyone plays a, a you know a video games that have like that live service type model, uh, every one of these holidays is just like Egg Day or Bunny Day or sl you know mm -hmm. or Slay Day. Right. You know, there's always this this weird sanitized version of this, and again, it's just amazing how easily that's reflected out of this movie in, into our present day, where every one of these bureaucracies sanitizes these religious, you know, symbols. One, one of the things that strikes me around, uh, you know, we have family movie night every Friday night. And so we've watched a lot of the films that are suitable for children, right? Including holiday films. And one of the things that always strikes me is they will have the Santa and the Easter bunny and so forth, but it's all about, it all ends up being about how you have to believe in Santa. The whole movie ends up, the linchpin is you've got to really believe in this fake thing right <laughs> or or there won't be joy in the world or something so it's like wait so are they talking about faith but the faith is in a thing that we all know is imaginary what's happening here you know but but it i see it in movie after movie after movie the same thing this huge emphasis on you know you've you got to clap for the fairy right and then peter pan or whatever or she'll die <laughs> it's but it's like that over and over uh, through these holiday films yeah, that is strange how the, it's like they feel that the archetype has to be presented inside the movie, but they know yeah. they can't present the real thing because that will yeah. offend people. And so we right. just, yeah, you're right. We just get this weird iteration on the theme without any of the truth behind it. it, it yeah, yeah a strong belief, a very strong belief in nothing in the middle, but nothing in, in it that you're actually believing in, right? Yeah. So, so eventually he tracks this woman down. He gets the information he needs and yeah. discovers she's a, she's a trucker. So she's someone who is driving around and she goes to these industrial sites, right? And he, he is assuming uh, that she is a terrorist, right? Like this is, this is one of the things that he ends up uh, uh, thinking that she's a terrorist. She's delivering a package. And so she must be one of the, the, the kind of terrorists that people are talking about all the time. And, uh, and so he accuses her of this and, uh, you know, she, he said, you know, she, she says, Oh, you work in an information retrieval. You're one of those guys. And he's like, well, I suppose you're one of the people that wants, you know, terrorists. And he's like, she's like, have you ever met any terrorists? Do you know? And again, it feels like, uh, we're, we're trapped uh, again, you know, what, 30 years before the nine 11, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years before the nine 11 events, uh, you, you have this reflection of, okay, uh, the, the, the specter of terrorism means we have to submit to this constant bureaucracy, this constant security apparatus. Yes. Everything has to be monitored, surveilled. 
but no one has actually ever run into the situation. You know, like people die, like we see the terrorist events, you know, but, but no one is really sure who's responsible or how anyone yeah. would, would, would actually be held accountable again for this. Why it's happening. Why it's exactly. happening. Yeah. Right. yeah. And that, that's what I was trying to get at earlier on that the, the global war on terror era that I remember very well, it felt like Brazil was the movie for that era. You know, it's, it, you've got to submit to all this, apparatus they're building and take your shoes off at the airport, which we're still doing, yes. etc. Because, you know, there's terrorists out there, man. You know? Well, and now they're doing it in the New York subway, right? Like they refuse right, to yeah. arrest people. <laughs> they refuse to arrest criminals. They were, in right. fact, the only people they arrest are the people trying to stop crime in the New York subway. And now they've brought in the National Guard and are doing, you know, uh, airport style, you know, security for the subway, yeah. not because we yeah. don't know how to stop crime, but because they refuse to do it and they'd rather have the bureaucratic control. And again, that dispersal of responsibility, right, is the key. Right. We're not racist. We're not, you know, we're not judging people. We don't want anyone, we don't want any cops to be, uh, so we're just going to screen everybody all the time. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the So key. we're now going to, we're, we're now going to pat down grandma to, right. to, as a virtue signal or something. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and I love that in one of the interviews, uh, in kind of the very British moment, you know, someone is they're, they're playing the background interview with the TV and one of the British ministers and they're asking him, hey, you know, why do you think there's terrorism? What do you, what do you think is going on? What's motivating these people to constantly commit these acts of terror? And the response from the minister is, Oh, I, yeah, I think it's a lack of sense of fair play. You know, they, they just, they, yeah, they, they just, a lot of people don't want to see someone else get ahead. And if, you know, if they yeah, would yeah. just play by the rules, then they would, they would be okay too, but they just can't stand it. You know, it very much is that, uh, that, that very British sense of, uh, of humor there, but, uh, but, but a beautiful well, it thing. Makes me, it makes me think of like, they hate us for our freedom, you know, all right. That, all that that they were peddling, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, that's ex exactly the right uh, the right comparison. The yeah, well, the, what they hate us for is our freedom. There's nothing else wrong with this this completely conformist, oppressive, depressing, you know, completely totalitarian society. It's our freedom. You know that that that's our prosperity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and again, it's that that theme of the information makes us free, right? It, it, it's the 1980. Uh, is it 1984 that has, you know, the, the walls and bars make you free? I'm trying to remember if that's an actual quote uh, from 1984. Well, sure, but, you know, you have, um, what, ignorance is strength and, uh, you know, all that yeah. sort of, those but, mottos. But, yeah, but but it really is that that iteration of, you know, we, we, of course we're free. Of course we're advanced. Of course we're civilized. We have the technology. We have the information. We have the bureaucracy. And that's what yeah. makes us, you know, the, the advanced civilization with the freedoms we have. Yeah, I, I meant to say it earlier, but let me drop it in now, which is that, you know, as you talked about the world that he gives us where. Um, well, so because it's, he's funny, right? It, it's a combination of this devotion to the idea of expertise and of, of bureaucratic process that is really well designed and all that combined with a clearly incompetent system. Right. I mean, it's not it's nuts how incompetent it is, um, but they really believe in it. Right. Uh, it it um, it makes me think of the progressives, not the progressives now, but the progressives from 100 plus years ago or, or in the U.S. or the Fabian Society in U.K., where it's all about rule by experts. Right. And so, you know, we've got to get rid of the chaos of charity and have a welfare state instead that has experts social workers, bureau bureaucratic processes, right? That's going to be the solution. Um, we've got to drop the term, right, Aaron? A managerialist system, right? That is, that is going to solve our problems because we are going to rationalize it. We're going to line it all up, make it systematic, and then we're going to have wonderful outcomes. Right. And that this movie is could it could be read so many ways, but one of them as a as an absolute slam against rule by experts and the progressives. Yes. And again, at every turn, like the oppression of the system, this this very uh, kind of uh, absurdist but dark aesthetic is contrasted with that high fantasy uh, dream yeah, sequences. Right. right. They're always peppered in to remind us that he's soaring above because one of the interesting things about the movie is it it has in a way a 
some of the beautiful aesthetics that we would think of in some of these type of movies. It has a neo noir, you know, art deco type look to it, right? Everyone's got mm-hmm. the trench coats with the hat and the that you get the, yeah, the, yeah. the the art right. deco statues and so in some ways it would look like a dark city or a, or a rocketeer yeah. in certain ways. But on top of that is this ugly layer of, I don't know, like fifties diners kitsch, right? Like, uh, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, the, there's these weird windows and the, and again, the, the, the ducks everywhere, everything. It looks like someone took a beautiful art deco city and then just like vomited a bunch of industrial, ugly, cheap stuff on top of it. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Speaking of the neo noir part, uh, one of the scenes visually that for me really stands out is people are leaving. I think information retrieval, if I remember correctly. But there's a bunch of bureaucrats. They're all dressed with uh, fedoras and trench coats. They look very much the same, right? They're all dressed very similarly, and they're all leaving work uh, dressed the same. And I, if I remember correctly, the camera pans up and is above them and just all these very similar looking figures pouring out of the building, these bureaucrats, well, they're worse than bureaucrats, right? Pouring out of the building. It's, it's, it's one of those scenes that really stuck visually in my head. Yeah. You have almost like ants just pouring out of the hill, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Very good. Yes. Yeah. So he, he ends up, uh, thinking that she's a terrorist and they go on this kind of long chase with the authorities uh you know uh, a lot of absurd uh, things happen but eventually he ends up being captured right and he ends up in the very torture chair uh you know that that his friend operates in fact he finds out his friend is behind the mask and he's trying to you know uh, he's trying to appeal to him his humanity but he's trying to you know uh, you're you're embarrassing me he's covering the microphone making sure to pull his mask down uh you know so that his you know his kind of emotion uh, doesn't show. So even though he's known this guy for a long time, he's connected to his family. At the end of the day, it's just another business transaction. You know, it's it's, it's another yeah, yeah. N- another thing. But but at the last second, um, you know the 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 rogue H back guys rappel down, uh, and they you know they they shoot the uh, the guy in the head, and uh, they 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 rescue him. The main character. They start taking him out of the building. I love that. There's this huge. Uh, again, it's not as stylized as the Matrix, but it, it reminded me of that big lobby shooting scene, you know, in the Matrix. Yeah. Where there's a huge firefight. But the whole time, uh, the, the janitors keep cleaning and the guy at the desk keeps doing boring <laughs> paperwork. Like, and it's really great because <laughs> the janitors, again, have like, they don't just have vacuums. Like, it's all got duct work being dragged behind it. So, like, all of the <laughs> gun shootout are like diving over like vacuum cleaner duct that's being dragged across the lobby and everything so it's this absurd like high energy you know firefight there's gruesome like there's bloody you know uh there's gore in this for sure it's rated r uh but it's all happening in this very absurd you know manner while everyone else is just carrying on the most mundane tasks it's really fantastic (laughs) right and so he's he's uh rescued um and uh, ultimately he is back in the truck driven by his dream girl Right. right. Yeah. And, and they and go th- everything wonderful. And this is the part that's a little confusing. Um, yeah. And they leave the city together. Right. They're getting out right. of the system. Um, and this is the part that is a little confusing about the history of the film. I thought that it was released in America where it stopped right there with that wonderful, happy ending. Um, I'm a little unclear on that, but at least that was one of the cuts they had. But in the actual director's cut, Aaron, <laughs> what yeah, happened? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the wild thing. You're right. So they go through and it's interesting because even once he's rescued and he meets her, you know, they, they kind of meet back. They're going back into these dream sequences again. You know, so he finally gets her, he gets to bed her and everything, you know, and, and they go through these dream sequences. And you're not sure, like, OK, he's just seeing her the way he wants to see her. And then it cuts back to the way she actually looks and these things. And he, like, goes through this strange dream sequence of his mother and he's like at a funeral and uh, you know, this is where she's super young and she doesn't even want to talk to him anymore because she's surrounded by all. And so things are getting more and more dreamlike. They're getting further or further away from the real world. And he keeps tumbling through these different kind of vignettes of, of, of more surreal dream until eventually you get to the, the big kind of twist ending where you realize it's all a dream and he's still stuck in the tortured chair. He, he never escapes. There was no 
there was no rescue there the, these you know robert de niro never shows back up and and liberates him and like you said i think in the original i only ever saw the the movie many years after its theatrical le- release so yeah. i'm only so familiar you saw the, you saw the, the sad ending yeah right that was the only one i even knew existed <laughs> And then you mentioned right. this, and when we started diving into it, I was like, oh, I didn't even know this was a thing. And it looks like there was a battle between Gillum to to keep in the edgier, kind of depressing cut, but of course it didn't do well with audiences right. that were, you know, I want to watch Monty <laughs> Python, you know. Uh, yeah, and right, so right. And, and so they kind of, kept, like you said, they, they kind of, it looks like they kept, we haven't seen the other ending, so we can't comment on kind of the, the more toned down ending, but it does look like there was, you know, there's a Blade Runner-esque battle over the editing rights yeah. and, and that's the end. right 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 but the real the real ending that the the gilliam director's ending or whatever is that um they uh the torturers realize that he is just completely insane at this point he's just he's completely in his head completely in his dreams and the film ends with them just walking away with him in the chair humming of course brazil right. the song brazil the song. which is the theme throughout the movie yeah that's and a great I've thing. Always loved that song ever since ever since that movie i've loved the song <laughs> when you when you explain the movie movie to people and you start with it's called brazil and it has nothing to do with brazil at all yeah, right. not even, it doesn't take place in brazil we probably, should have mentioned, we probably should have mentioned that it is not set in brazil it's right. just the song represents um a happier place or something yes. right yeah yeah so, so Go ahead. Did you? Well, have, I, just I, say, well, I wanted to talk about the dreams at some point. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll definitely. Yeah, I just wanted to say for the re, the ending real quick. What do you think about that ending? Because so many of these movies do end on a happier note when they're in this theme. There is some form of liberation. There's some crack in the system that allows you to know that you're going to make it through. Of course, 1984 doesn't do that. They, you know, Winston eventually, yeah. you know, be, becomes uh, uh, realizes his love for Big Brother. Uh, but brave, but brave, what do you brave th- new world that the, the 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 man who's outside of the system who's come into the system just hangs himself, right? Right. So yes. yeah, yeah, he's really keeping with the darker dystopian tradition here. Uh, what do you think that says yeah. about you know his 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 understanding of the bureaucratic system and and what he thinks will be the possibility of of people breaking through? Well, this is the time to show your book, the total state. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> My commercial. <laughs> because, yeah. I was actually thinking about it, thinking back through this film, because it is um, the the moments of escape from this total bureaucratic state in the film are um, all illusions, right? So in the film, as the viewer, you get to go with him on his dream in his dreams, and you get to feel a relief from the 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 ugliness and the bureaucracy and the system, the soulless system. But it's clear in the film that that is all just made up in his mind. That's not the lived reality of the people in this world, right? Um, that is him wanting to be out of it, but not succeeding. And, and of course, at the end, he really doesn't succeed, even though he's you know gone crazy and sort of thinks he has, right? He's never able to get out of the system. So, so yeah, I mean, I... I think that the, the whole point that Gilliam's doing is that he is going to, he's really going to do a dystopia and he's going to go for it, right? Yeah. He's not going to give you any signs of like, oh yeah, but there's this bright side to it. No, no, no. The, any bright side that you think is there is a, a trick, an illusion. You're going to wake up someday or whatever, and you're going to realize that, no, 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 there is nothing else but this. It's pretty soul crushing, actually. Yeah. I mean, I, I did. I hadn't thought about that uh, in its entirety, but you're right that there's every moment of hope, like every moment yeah. of resistance, really is one in which there, it's an illusion. Maybe the only thing that's even a deviation is the Robert De Niro character. Like we were yeah, pretty sure yeah, he's yeah. real, and yeah. even in that moment, his act of rebellion, like his very edgy uh, way to escape the system is to go out and repair stuff for free to people when the bureaucracy yeah, yeah. isn't getting around to it. That's as yeah, yeah. wild. So he's as not he's not exactly he's not exactly an anarchist tearing it down or something, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, even 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 the, the the greatest act of defiance in the movie is simply a maintenance of the system. It's simply a more efficient version of maintaining what w- the world that they live in. Yeah. There's there is no moment right. where there's actual liberation. There. Robert De Niro's uh, air conditioner repairman is just containment, Aaron. Face yeah, it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Very true. 
so you wanted to say um, more about the yeah, uh, the, the yeah so thinking about this thinking about this movie um and maybe some of the other themes in gilliam's film i wanted to particularly mention uh the adventures of baron munchausen it's a big favorite of mine and i think that if you um like brazil and you haven't caught baron munchausen i'd really recommend it uh, and I think you'll see a lot of a lot of similar themes. And as I was mentioning, Aron, I think it has the best like little it's like 30 seconds, 30, 60 seconds uh, reactionary moment in, in a Gilliam film that absolutely slams like the French Revolution and, the, and leftist violence. It's just marvelous. It's worth seeing for that. And there's so much more in there. Um, but but um, it, it, it got me thinking the, the the strong theme of dreams. It got me thinking about escape. And that got me thinking about Tolkien writing about fantasy um, in his wonderful essay on fairy stories and in which he addresses the critics who say, the problem with fantasy is that it's just escapism. You're just trying to get away from the real world, right? And so Tolkien responds to this very thoughtfully and he says, <laughs> he says, you know, usually in real life when we talk about escape, it's a positive thing. You know, you're trapped and you escape from the trap. You're in jail. You escape from the jail, right? You're you're going to you're escaping into freedom, right? Um, and he says, so why couldn't fantasy be, as I think we see it is in Brazil, why can't it be an escape from your awful system that you guys are a part of? You know, this this modern dystopian bureaucratic soulless machine that we're more and more getting trapped in. Um, is that is that okay? we escape from it, even for a moment, even while we read a little story? Can we be out of your system, please? Anyway, so I, that, that's something that this movie made me think of, which I had never made that connection before, thinking about Tolkien on escape. Yeah, it's interesting that there's never any moments of, of fantasy uh, on the, we, we see a lot of media in the movie, uh, but it's never anything of <laughs> escape. It's always news, it's always a discussion. Yeah, and yeah. Um, Part of that is obviously just moving the story along. It's it's just it's you know just story pipe. But it, there, there's also the the fact that in this omnipresent bureaucratic state where you know you would often see uh, you know in, in other dystopias some kind of propaganda film or some you know some some kind of entertainment that at least had the propaganda message inside of it. There's never any of that. There's never any escape. There's never even moment of levity. Uh, again, like you said, the only escape is ever through. Uh, through the dreams uh the the, the right. people inside are never allowed to to view something i don't think they do have i guess they do have the movies uh, they actually in fact we do see real world movies i want to say it's a wonderful life is on there at some point oh where, like, okay yeah that sounds like around around yeah. but they're but so so we do see it's connected in some way to our own world uh but there's but there's no you know there's nothing new there's there's nothing new yeah. that is media produced that's escapist by the system. The only thing they seem to have is left over from a time where they, they weren't trapped in, I guess, this level of bureaucracy. So, so here's a beautiful line from, from this section I'm thinking of of Tolkien. He says, uh, why should a man be scorned if finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if when he cannot do, do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and pivot over to the questions of the people. But before we do, Stephen, yeah. you have an excellent podcast. You do a great you do a great amount of work on the violence of the left, which I think is really important. It's something that doesn't get yeah. documented enough. Can you tell people a little bit about that and where to find it? Yeah, I'll mention that. So I have a, a channel on YouTube called Radical Liberation. <clears throat> we do some economic analysis every other week. And then on the uh, other weeks, I I um, kind of do political history and things like that. One series we concluded recently is called the Left Wing Terror Series. And this tries to fill in the blanks for the, uh, uh, as we joke about on the internet, why some things happen for no reason at all, right? <laughs> so so in, the left wing, in the Left Wing Terror Series, I try to fill in the for no reason at all um, and, and show how there's a consistent history for hundreds of years uh, particularly with the French Revolution afterwards, but we actually start the series prior to that. Um, there's a history of what I think is fair to call left-wing terror, where there's assassinations, there's terror bombings, <laughs> like we see in Brazil, right? Um, 
And uh, this is all in the name of seizing power so that they can impose their utopia, right? And then it doesn't work out so well, and it's time for another round of left-wing violence to, to try to make the utopia happen this time. Um, many of these episodes I talk about are not well remembered. Um, for example, one of the episodes is uh, about Red Bavaria, when part of Germany uh, was taken over by communists after World War I. Um, another section is about Italy, where a number of Italian cities were taken over by communists. Um, and this is all flushed down the toilet because it doesn't make the left look so good. And our history, as I think you figured out, Aron, is seems to be pretty much curated by the left. <laughs> written by the victors, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah, written by the victors. Yes. Well, well, well put. Yeah, everybody should definitely check those out. Like I said, they're historical deep dives of a lot of things that people are not familiar with. And like you said, when you start filling in, it's a it's amazing how much uh, you know go further down these rabbit holes. The more history you know, the more uh, yeah. you know events make sense, and you're like, oh wow, yeah, no, things that's didn't why they just did suddenly that. happen. Yeah, all right, the, yeah, <laughs> can actually causality. see it. causality. Causality, it's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. knew? It wasn't just that everyone who disagreed was was evil all the time. All right, so. Right. right. Uh, let's go ahead and go to our questions here. Creeper Weirdo says, but have you watched Brazil 200 times? <laughs> then you'll fully understand it. You know, the, again, the, the story of Brazil is not particularly complicated. There, there's not, you know, other, there's a couple of twists and turns, but you can follow it pretty easily. Uh, the it, the yeah. interesting thing, the thing is how much of the visual you can catch. Uh, we, we can, yeah. we talked a lot uh, about the visual so much, representation there's a lot here. Different. There's a lot going on on the screen. You brought out details. Now I'm wanting to watch it again because I'm like, well, I don't remember catching the janitors. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of things that like the, the, the main thing happening on the screen has got your attention. And off in the corner, there's something really funny going on if you just notice, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's the feeling yeah. I have the whole time is you you really, yeah. it's, you, you could do a Where's Waldo to find all the absurd little yeah. bits that are occurring in each scene. So it's one of those things that yeah. definitely benefits from a careful watching, not so much for the story, but for the visuals. We we can talk about yeah. it ad nauseum, but it's something you really should see for yourself. We haven't, even if Absolutely. we just spoiled the ending for you, it's worth watching just because you oh, yeah. capture all yeah, of yeah, those yeah. visuals. Uh, Capitalismo says, Gilliam is great, but Baron Munchausen is the best of the Imagination Trilogy. Yeah, he yeah, must have I'm said that before. I've you heard got the to. term Imagination Trilogy. That might be Time Bandits Brazil and the Adventures of, Adventures of Baron Munchausen, because the later films are The Fisher King with uh, Robin Williams, um, Twelve Monkeys, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, um, and then some, some later, more recent films. But those are sort of the classic. The 80s and the 90s films, I think, are really... If you watch those, you'll understand why Gilliam's one of my top two directors of all time. Yeah, obviously, I've seen the Monty Python stuff, Fear and Loathing, 12 Monkeys, mm. uh, uh, Brazil. And then I saw the the one of the newer ones he had, like the Imaginarium of somebody. Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Yeah, I have yeah. not seen that one. Yeah, I think the I'm trying to remember. It's like the main actor died in the, the beginning of the film. And so they end up oh. placing him throughout the film with different people because... You know, they, you know, so they, they, they like turned it into a visual uh, kind of uh, language, like uh, which is an interesting way yeah. to solve that problem. But, um, but that's all I really remember about that movie. But yeah, the, for what I've seen, it, like, yeah, I love 12 Monkeys. It's oh, great. yeah, no, that's classic, a classic, classic performance by uh, Brad Pitt, I think, right? It's, it's Willis and Pitt, I think, right? Yeah, that, yeah. No, yeah, it's Bruce yeah, Willis, Willis for sure. And I, yeah, I Brad think Pitt. Bruce Willis is the time traveler, and then Brad Pitt is the bad yeah. guy, I think, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, that's one of those that kept popping on uh, like TNT all the time when I was, uh, you know, like one of those those uh, uh, channels that played movies all the time uh, in the middle of the day. So I remember that one. Roberta says, honest question, do you guys think terrorists, the, the, the terrorists are real? I know Gillum hinted that they are, but I'm wondering what you guys mm. think. I, I don't think, I think you said it right, Arnon. He doesn't really ever give us that is not the story we're being told we're mm -hmm. not being told the story of the terrorists yeah the, the, the main character thinks that his dream woman is a terrorist but that's not correct right um so the terrorists are a backdrop and i don't pr frankly i don't think he ever tells us or even suggests whether the terrorists are real or uh what's it called a uh, false flag or a mix you you, you can kind of you kind of bring your own ideas to that, but I don't think he really gives us much. Did you catch something? 
No, I have the same feeling. It really is that, yeah. uh, you know, the, especially as the dreams get more thoroughly mixed in uh, and it's not always clear, you know, how much of a scene is reality, uh, that becomes more and more of a question as well. And, and I think it's like Blade Runner as where, you know, the more you the, the more information you get about what actually is happening, the worse the film gets. Like the cuts where they try to explain everything about, you know, who's a replicant and who isn't and who's definitive. It's like, no, actually, the ambiguity is a much better uh, aspect of the film. So I, I think it's actually yeah, better yeah. that we don't know yeah. Uh, yeah, how much of that is is manufactured by the government, how much of what happened is is his imagination. I think all of that being ambiguous is, is part of the charm and, yeah. and uh, yeah. Agreed. the movie. Uh, Creepy Weird also says Jesus comes with baggage, Santa comes with Coke. I see, I see what you did there. <laughs> see what you Very did good. there. Well done. All Very right. Good, yeah. uh, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up, guys. Again, make sure to check out Steven's channel, especially that Violence of the Left uh, series. That's an excellent Left Wing Terror. Yeah. Left Wing Terror. There's a playlist. Yeah. If you go to my channel, you can find the playlist. It's all there in order. Absolutely. And of course, if it's your first time on this channel, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe. Make sure that you turn on your notifications, click the bell, everything that you need to catch these streams when they go live. Uh, if you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the Orin McIntyre show on your favorite pos- podcast platform. And if you guys would like to check me out over on Timcast, I'll be on the show tomorrow night. So I'll see you over there. Thank you for watching, guys. And as always, I'll talk to you next time.